Okay. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson, Richard James, and Chris Dale. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. I don't know why I sound like a policeman. <laughs> Do a bad <laughs> policeman joke now. Uh, let's no, Be that... Avenue, 999 Let's Be Avenue. No, that's not really a joke. That's just a thing. Gosh, well, that's well. a template with the sort of humour you can expect from this week's Jerry Anson podcast, uh, Pod 286. Pod 286, that's right, the Jerry Anson podcast. I had to podcast. look at the script. Yeah, you did, I noticed. We're getting through them at a rate of knots. We're fast closing in on our 300th, you know. Do we have yes. plans? Uh, no, but Popstrons, if you th- have, can think of something we should do for our 300th episode, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Podcast at jerryanson.com or tweet us with the hashtag Jerry Anson Podcast. Yeah. Or post on the Podstrons Facebook group, facebook.com yeah. slash groups slash Podstrons. Yes. Is that do right? all that. I'll tell you something we could do for our 300th. Uh, have Get a week it off. right. Oh, <laughs> have a week off. <laughs> That's about the same thing, actually, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Anyway, so yeah, after right. all these years. Yes. Hang, hang on, how many is 300? I can't even work out the numbers. Well, it's like, nearly six years, isn't it? Yes. It's going to be that long. <laughs> yeah. I can't believe it. I've got old doing this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, mm. uh, yes, so if you've got an idea, we'd love to know. Maybe, it, uh, should we do a live one? I don't know. It's too far off for me to even it's think about. It's not that far off. We've got Christmas to get through, yeah. But a nice, a nice live podcast in a nice venue would be quite fun. We could do it at the Curve in Slough. Okay, fine. We don't need to have this conversation while people are listening, do no, we? No, but I'm just giving them ideas. Anyway, <laughs> right. uh, whatever we do, it'll yeah. be the same old nonsense that oh, we've been for doing sure. for 285 episodes previously. <laughs> Had to take the number again. Uh, <laughs> where yeah. we, uh, we, being uh, you, Richard James. Yeah. There it is. And you, Jamie yeah, Anderson. Jamie Anderson. And, and him over there. Oh, yes. Chris Dale. Oh, hello, Chris. Hi, Hi Chris. Oh, it's about time he changed out that T-shirt, isn't it? Man, it's, it's getting a bit wimpy. Do you want to tell him? <laughs> yeah, all right. Yeah. It's a bit I'm not going to tell him now in front of these people. I'll do no, no, we, do, we don't want to embarrass the poor no. chat. Uh, anyway, we're here every week. and We do Anderson yes. stuff, and Chris does the randomizer, and I do Fab Facts, and, yep. and you do stuff. Are you interview uh, what people? Do I do? Oh, yes, that's right. That's who are you interviewing this week? Well, yes, that's right. Yes, we have an, a special guest joining us this week and next week for the uh, uh, two-part interview with uh, Sadie Miller. Mm. Sadie Miller, voiceover artist, author, um, uh, recently recreating uh, the part played by her late mother, Elizabeth Slade, and Sarah Jane yes. Smith in the Big Finish Doctor Who audio adventures. Yes. Uh, but also a Jerry Anderson fan, thankfully for us. Thank goodness. It'd be yes. awkward if she turned up and she wasn't. <laughs> yeah, it would. What? Actually, it would still be quite a pleasant conversation, I think. I'm sure she's lovely. Well, we'll so, wait and see. I'm yeah. going to hold judgment. Yeah. Do you know what? I think because it's out now, isn't it? The 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 the, the Doctor <sighs> of War that's been released by Big Finish, has, has it? it? I don't know. You're trying to go very dangerous. Uh... Yeah, well, if not, you'll have to cut this out. But, uh, but... I, I, it, there's a bit at the beginning. It's like an alternative um, uh, Genesis the Daleks oh. retelling where yeah. uh, they all get exterminated. Right. And I got to direct yeah. Tom. Yeah. Uh, Sadie yeah. and Chris Naylor playing Harry, Harry Sullivan, Sullivan yeah. to recreate that kind of oh, iconic moment. Do I have the right? Oh. You can't doubt it. And I got got Sadie to do her that that lovely, yeah. you know, frustrated. You yeah. can't doubt it yeah. moment. Oh, it was so, she's so I good. Try, it was I, so I, I great. I think you should interview her. Nah, because it's only that. Oh, that's, that's all you have to talk about. Also, with Craig Morris previously, I'm yes. totally exhausted You're, on the interview. I need, I need it until after New Year. Oh, you poor lamb. Uh, how about you cheer yourself up with your favourite item in the podcast? What, what's that? Fab facts. Fab facts! Go on, right, have this one on facts. me. Let's do it now. Yeah. Now, time for this week's Fab Facts. You're so nice letting me do Fab Facts. That's, that's quite all right. No, yeah. go on. Okay, well... I'd just like to see your face light up like that. It's quite sweet. It's, it's quite endearing. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Nobody ever calls me that. So I've got a book of fab facts, as you know. We know that. You're going to shout fab. Always. During a period in which I'm flicking pages, mm-hmm. that will stop me flicking pages. Yes. And then hopefully on that page or a nearby one, there will be a fab fact. You always make it sound more complicated than it need be, I think. Yeah, I Probably do. just checking there. <laughs> just che- checking that I had uh, prepared the book adequately. Uh, in what way? I don't know. <laughs> anyway, are you ready? Mm. Uh, yes, I'm here, ready. Here we go. Fab! Oh, what? Oh. What's up? Yeah, that's fine. I, 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 yeah. Yes? Yeah. Is everything prepared adequately? Of course it is. I thought it was random. I thought it was it a thing. Is, it is random. Right. But, you know, as we've said before, sometimes mm. the flicking takes me Sticky to the middle of a fab fact. Yes, fine. Or oh, the I tail see. end of one, and I have to flick back to the start Yeah, fair enough. Okay. Yeah? I understand. Because they're often two or three pages. I think we've got a four-page fab fact, haven't we? Oh, I don't know. I've obviously blanked that from my that memory. That was very it long. Was too much. Yeah. Anyway, pod yes. 286 is fab fact. Pod 286. Yes. Goes. I had to check the number. As follows. Right. 
It concerns one of the unsung heroes of the Jerry Anderson universe. Ah, about time. A legendary figure. Yes. Who went on to garner legendary status, oh, no, but when his services were required by a certain Barry Gray in 1957, oh, not me, was a lowly guitar for hire. Oh. Bert Whedon. A name I know, yes. Really? Yes, I think so. It's yeah. not one I know, so ah. I'm going to learn something. Mm -hmm. uh, was born in East Ham, London on May the 10th. 1920. Right. His early days in show business found him playing with all the top bands of the day, including Ted Heath, Mantovani, yeah. the Squadronaires, oh. not one I'm familiar with, and many others. Right. His extreme versatility acted as a stepping stone to a, uh, to a plum role as a featured soloist with the BBC Show Band Show. Yes. That's a great title. The Show Band Show. The Show Band Show, uh, which meant broadcasting three times a week in the country's top pop music show, and this lasted for four years. Yeah. He was quite famous then. Absolutely, was he? he was famous, yes. And he famously released a whole sort of um, slew of um, lessons playing playing guitar, the Burt Wheaton really? way. Yeah. I mean, it may say this later on, but that's great to know. Thank you. Yeah, right. uh, his early classical training later proved to be a great asset since uh, his thorough grounding enabled him to play any form of music at sight. Yes. Jazz, beat, ballads, dance music, yep. classical, and even Spanish flamenco style. <laughs> Makes sense why you've worn that shirt now. Uh, perhaps it was this first facility that in 1956 caught Barry Gray's ear when he was approached to record the music for Roberta Lee's The Adventures of Twizzle, mm -hmm. produced by a certain AP Films I think you may be familiar <laughs> with. Lee stipulated that Barry be appointed as musical director. However, she did not want Gray to compose the music for the series. Instead, her friend, Leslie Clare, hummed tunes into a tape recorder and Lee wanted Gray to arrange, orchestrate and record these for the show. There you go. I want it like that. Yeah. Fair well, enough. Well, my, well, my mate to hum it. <laughs> Interesting. The first session uh, recording for Twizzle took place at Gate Studios in Elstree on September the 6th, 1957 uh, and cost a princely £115. Amazing. Uh, a 13-piece is that right? 115 pounds? That sounds very expensive then, but okay. Uh, it's a 13-piece orchestra. Yeah, a 13-piece. In piece, a studio. Yeah, fair enough. A 13-piece combination was uh, was utilised with the legendary Burt Whedon on guitar. Aha. Uh -huh. Just a day's work for Burt Whedon, but part of a rich career that led to an appearance on Thames TV's This Is Your Life. Yes, remember it well. Among the people paying tribute to Burt were... Eric Clapton, mm -hmm. Brian May, yeah, right. Hank Marvin, Phil Collins, Adam Faith, Val Dunican, Joe Brown, Lonnie Donegan, Marty Wilde. What a list. Yes. Marty Wilde, Frank Bruno. Yes. Okay, Henry Cooper, Paul Daniels, ah. Gloria Hannaford, ah. <laughs> Basil Brush. Oh, the greats. And many other stars <laughs> from the world of show business. How many other soon-to-be superstars had a brush with the music of Barry Gray and the world of Anderson? Mm -hmm. Perhaps Ringo Starr played the zither on Torture the Battery Boy. Or maybe Elton John tickled the ivories for I Wish I Was a Spaceman from Five Likes to Five. Maybe he did. <laughs> he didn't. Okay. He didn't. They didn't do no. that. All right. Podstrons, if you know, do let us know. Yes. Uh, and maybe we can start curating our very own Jerry Anderson Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah. yeah I'm surprised you haven't heard of Burt Whedon. He's quite a bit Isn't that figure. weird? Mm. It's just, just, I find quite often that yes. I'm basically culturally unaware. Well, we know that. <laughs> yes, I suspect as much. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, nice. Uh, because that's, uh, we know about the Spectrum, of course, who did the uh, yes. the, the Captain Scarlet thing. And Cliff Richard in the Shadows on Thunderbirds Arco, of And course. Um, what's his name, who did uh, Wish I Was a Spaceman? Don Spencer. That's the one. Is that right? Yes. No comment from the randomizer. It must so, be yes. right. Uh, yes, so, uh, yeah, interested to hear of Burt Wheaton appearing there as well. Yeah. Yeah. No, I had well, no, look no him clue. Up. Look him up, yeah. I okay. think he died around about the same time as your dad, I think about 2012, oh. 2011, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. So, I mean, this is a lovely lesson. There you go. See, you learn things from fat, fat, Fab Facts every week, don't, don't you? Easy for you to say. Oh, well, it's not, clearly. <laughs> yeah, great. You, like were, you actually seem quite interested there. Well, yeah, I did quite like that one. It was two weeks in the trot when you've been happy. Brief. That's why. Well, it, was, it was still a two-pager. Was it? Mm. What's anyway. your ideal length of Fab Fact, do you think? Oh, one page, really. <laughs> <laughs> Reading's very hard. I know. I have to really concentrate you do to do very that. Well, yes. <laughs> You're so patronising. Uh, anyway, Posturons, if you know of any other superstars mm -hmm. in the making mm -hmm. who ended up connected to the world of Anderson, maybe just through music or maybe elsewhere. We'd well, like to know. I mean, we're going back to Idris Elba in Space Precinct there, then, aren't we? Yes. Mm. Do we have to do that? <laughs> no, no, we don't have to. No. It always gets brought, brought up all it the does, time. It does, it does. All the poor the time. man. Yeah. Yes. Anyway, all because of his not very good American accent. Anyway, uh, yes, email us podcastarians.com or not. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah. But that mm -hmm. is the end. Uh oh. Oh, I've got no idea. Go of this week's. Bird fact! fact.
fact. Music fact's a bit generic. I know, it? but I couldn't think of anything else. No. And I'd actually forgotten his name <laughs> by the time we did it. That's right. I'm sure he'd say much the same about you. Absolutely. And so rightly, so, yeah. rightly so. Rightly uh, so. Coming up a bit later on, of course, we have the amazing randomizer with the amazing randomizer. We have the first part of my interview with the amazing Sadie Miller. Yes. Uh, we've got the amazing Podstroms yes. to uh, hear from as well, who've been uh, emailing us at podcast at cherryanderson.com. This is the voice of the Podstorms. Yes, it's the voice of the Podstorms. It's your opportunity to get in touch uh, by emailing us at podcast at jerryanderson.com to let us know what you think about anything Jerry Anderson related. Questions, comments, abuse? Ideally not. Yeah. Uh, shall I go first? Why not? Alex in Suffolk. Hello, everyone. Hello, that's nice, isn't low, it? That's, that's very generic. Though. Inclusive. No, it's good. I like it. Okay. Uh, just a quick message of apology, he says. That's a great way you to You were start. kind enough to read out my chronology question in pod 279, a question you answered unequivocally and concisely. Thumbs up. Brilliant. And to prove it, thumbs up emoji. Uh, yeah, this was about the uh, Thunderbirds chronology, I think. Yes. However... Being not very tech-savvy, I wasn't sure my email had got through, so a week later, after the next podcast reminded me, I sent the same question again, which you then kindly answered <laughs> in pod 282. I'm sure when I read it, or when I said, I feel like this happened before, and we did it anyway, so there we go. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm certain there was a look oh. of uh, deja vu on Jamie's face, says there Alex, it is. as he went through it all over again. <laughs> there was, yes. Now I feel bad because I might have been, uh, taken up another Podstron's turn at having his or her question answered. Doesn't yeah. work like that, Alex. Doesn't. Uh, sincere apologies to all concerned. None required. Please take them back. Yes. Alex in Suffolk. P.S. Is there any more XL5 merch in the works? Asks Alex. Yes, Alex, there is. Is there? Yeah. Anyway. Oh. I've course. got one here from Caleb. Such a tease. Yeah. Good day. Good day, Caleb. Says, I'm not doing the accent. That oh. be, risks being very offensive, I think. Uh, I found a reference to Thunderbird 2's launch sequence in a rather obscure place. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Have you heard of Wallace and Gromit? <laughs> yeah, well, yes. Uh, yes. Doesn't sound very obscure to me. I should hope so. Oh, yeah. Uh, but if you haven't, mm. I mean, who hasn't? Mm. If you haven't, Podstrons, and mm. this is the first time you're hearing of it now, with an email us, po uh, podcast at jerryanson.com with the subject line, I'd never heard of Wallace and Gromit <laughs> until now. Yeah. Uh, it's a stop motion series made by Ardman. It is. Yeah. An episode in one of the short series Cracking Contraptions oh, yeah. called Shopper 13 is where this reference occurs. Wallace and Gromit prepare something for launch, and after pressing the launch button, the scene cuts to their garage where two small trees fall down on either side, exactly like the palm trees in Thunderbird 2's launch sequence. It's then revealed that the thing that was launched was a shopping cart. Uh, the trees yeah. falling down yep. had no purpose whatsoever. Uh, what do you think? A coincidence? I think or not. a reference? It's a reference. Mm, of course it is. Obviously yes. a reference. Well, and the whole, you know, the, 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 the shoot getting coming down for breakfast and all that. Yeah, and, and the pond flipping over. Yes. And, they, you know, they, Nick Park and the rest of the team at Ardman are massive Anderson fans. Yes. They reference it all the time. Yeah. Uh, Nick Park cites watching Thunderbirds as one of the things that inspired him to go into animation in the first mm. place. Uh, so, yes, it's they're, they're full of pastiche, homage and... Uh, Fromage. <laughs> Fromage. Well, more cheese, Gromit. Uh, yeah, yes, nice. we You're must so get clever, on the podcast. Mm, I have my moments. Ah, oh, I mean, we can all relax now, can't we? Can we? Yeah, because we've had an email from Phil Steer. Phil Steer. Ah, oh, so nice to get one from Phil Steer, isn't, isn't it? it? Hi, guys, says Phil. Steer. Uh, I haven't been in touch for a while. Yes. Where, you, where have you been, I Phil know, Steer? Been bereft. So I really just wanted to say hello and that I'm still here and to thank you for the weekly podcast pleasure. Our pleasure, Phil Steer. But... As I'm writing, I do have a quick question. Why does the randomizer not include Dick Spanner when it does include the protectors? Are they not equally Jerry Anderson Productions? Just curious. Well, Phil's dear. Yes. The randomizer is just around the corner. Yes. It... What, what's going on with Dick Spanner, randomizer? Well, it is in there, but I'm doing the um, two two part compilation version. Uh... So I did one of them back in pod 20 something. So that, that was a two-parter. There. there you go, Phil Steer. It's actually not Chris's problem, it's yours. Yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> also, he goes on, with your heartfelt pleas for all Podstrons to subscribe to the podcast, I just wonder if your stats give the true picture. For example, I listen, and of course subscribe, via Pocket Casts. Would you see that in your stats? I don't mean see me specifically, says Phil, but do you see any Pocket Casts subscribers? It may be that you have a much higher proportion of subscribers than you think. We don't get any data from Pocket Casts, no. Oh. We only get data from the big ones, mm. uh, Apple, 
Mm. Spotify. <laughs> now we're going back. Uh, a right. few others, yes. yes. Oh, but, I see. But still, you know, it all helps. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, in a similar vein, as a Pocket Casts listener, I am unable to leave a revating. I say this not to defend myself, mm, although yes. many podcasts ago you did uh, question why there was no revating from me and strongly suggest it would be better for me if there were. <gasps> yes, that sounds rather threatening. I'm sorry. No, we that. didn't do that. It was encouraging. Ah, fine. Mm. Uh, but again, perhaps there are others like me who might wish to leave a revating but are unable to do so. Well, you can still do it. There's a there's a there's like an IMDb for podcasts. Well, as we discussed last time, you can mm. leave a review or a mm. rating on our I, on our IMDb, IMDb yeah. page. But there's also another one in the service name I've completely forgotten, but <sighs> right. we'll tweet about it or something. Yes, and that it is essentially IMDb for podcasts, and you can leave a, a rating there. Fine. So, Phil, there are plenty of places you can do it. There you go. Uh, but he concludes. So be encouraged. I'm sure most of us have subscribed and would leave a rating if we could. Well, anyway, you can. enough of my wittering. All best wishes to you and all the Postrons. Phil brackets steer. steer. Thank you, Phil Steer. It's Thanks, always nice. Phil. Yeah. And now we can look forward to a Phil Steer rating on all platforms because <laughs> right. now Phil Steer knows that Phil Steer can leave a Phil Steer rating. Thank you, <laughs> Phil Steer. Yeah. Look forward to it. Good. Uh, I have an extremely compact one. Excellent. Jack McMorrow. Yes. Or maybe it's Jack MC Morrow. I don't know. Oh, right. There's Get a space the there. Yeah. Uh, could we get an SSC to complement the SPV and Angel Interceptor, says Jack. Right. Could we? Uh, probably. Are you going to um, just explain all those acronyms for those of us who aren't? Uh, no, I think it's quite fully. fun to leave them uh, unexplained. <laughs> no, uh, Spectrum Pursuit Vehicle. Yeah. Uh, SSC, Spectrum Saloon Car, but uh, also known uh, as the SPC, uh, Spectrum Patrol Car. There's a, there's a constant now argument there. It's the little red one with a little yes, thing on the back. Know, yeah. Uh, Corgi certainly did one. Yes, they did. Yes. And they're doing more and more stuff. I mean, they're doing the Stingray that we showed off. But, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Right. So maybe. Okay. We'll have to see. Yeah, fine. Great. Uh, all for now. Keep them coming in, as we always say. And you always do, actually. I mean, it's almost like I don't have to ask. Why do you bother? But, well, the week I don't ask is the yeah, week we don't get emails at that'd them. That'd be embarrassing. And what do we do? We we'll have to make them up. We just hand straight over to Chris and the randomizer at the beginning of the podcast. Well, many people would love that. <laughs> uh, podcast at jerryanderson.com. Send us your comments, thoughts, reviews, anything you want, really. And, um, mm. you know, if it's appropriate, we'll read them out. They mostly are. Have we had any inappropriate ones? What, read out? Uh, no, no, not read out, but yeah. there was that one. Oh, uh, remember that one. The... I don't want to talk about that. No, with the think, links on it. I think the court case is still pending, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, very awkward. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Great. Well, now, we've uh, covered all bases, I think, there. I think it's about time that we moved on to our special guest this week. I'm very excited to have her in the studio, so... Um, <sighs> Would you mind just um, vacating the chair? Yes, I will allow you to move from the ridiculous to the sublime. Ah, oh, thanks. This week's guest made her TV debut age just eight in the BBC One film Royal Celebration. She's written short stories, novellas, novels and poems, as well as a novel for the lethbridge Stewart range for Candy Jar Books. She's more recently reprised the role played by her mother Elizabeth Sladen, Sarah Jane Smith for Big Finish, but she's also shared screen time with a young Jamie Anderson. To tell us more, it's Sadie Miller! Sadie, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Well, you made an extra special effort to come all the way to Slough. I hope it hasn't been a disappointment so far. <laughs> no, it's been lovely. Thank you. <laughs> now, we're going to talk to you about your wide-ranging career. Uh, our viewers and listeners have sent in some questions that they would uh, want me to ask you a little later on. Uh, we're going to be looking at some clips of your first Anderson memories, your favourite characters, and also a couple of little treats as well that we've thrown in for good measure. Lovely. So, uh, a family of actors... Uh, mother and father, both in the business, of course, uh, Brian Miller and uh, Elizabeth Sladen. Uh, what sort of a house did you grow up in then? Was it a theatrical household? I suppose it was really without uh, intentionally thinking about it. I think uh, by the time I came along, my mum was sort of semi-retired. So ah. I don't think that her acting was necessarily something I was overly aware of, but certainly my dad was working consistently. Yeah. But it was all quite separate from me as as a child. My dad did a lot of theatre work, a lot of work on the radio, oh. um, stuff that I wasn't necessarily exposed to. So it just felt very, very normal, really. <laughs> nothing... Oh. Um, Nothing that I would say was particularly um, different about it. A normal yeah. family house, really. Yeah, I see. And uh, was there a moment in your early life where you thought, OK, there was nothing special, perhaps, about what your mum and dad were doing, but that you might want to follow in their footsteps at some point? Or did that come later? I think I was always a bit of a weird child. I always felt different to other, other kids, really. And I think my play and my creativity was kind of a disassociation a little bit from, from reality. I didn't really realise... That's what it was until I got older. Ah. Um, so I used to just love being other people and kind of getting to play different roles, even as a child. And it kind of 
the enjoyment, the play side of it was really what attracted me, right. me to it. Right. Um, and I think with parents who are actors who, I think being an actor, you live a bit outside of the norm anyway because your job is also such an integral part of who you are. And I think for a lot of people, they don't necessarily understand that that dichotomy because to them their job is very separate to yes. the rest of their life it facilitates the rest of their life where yes. for actors it is their life so yes. I think it was just something that I assimilated as part of myself and I didn't really realize um that's interesting um so when I was working as a child I think it was just the enjoyment of it more than yeah. more than anything else really what do you remember of your early career I think your first <laughs> tv appearance was aged eight is that right in yeah that it was it was really good fun yeah um everyone that I worked with on um it was a, just a little tv film called Royal Celebration yeah. uh, with Leslie Phillips so I get to sit on his knee between Great. takes and he Great. was so kind and yeah. uh mini driver Rupert Ev uh, not who am I saying Rupert Graves yeah yeah, yeah. Um, where my, my parents and, and everyone was very, um, you know, very uh -huh. lovely to a little child. But it was, um, I felt very adult at quite a young age, being around so many adults. And I yeah. think it's something that I wouldn't necessarily choose for my own children. I think right. it's nice to have a childhood that is not encumbered by the knowledge of adult. Yes. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, you mentioned there that you, what attracted you to sort of perhaps the acting side of things but was, was, was playing. Make believe? Yeah, totally. Is that something you've carried with you into your adult life? I think so, yeah. <laughs> yeah? I try and be as disconnected from reality as possible at all times. Um, it's so underrated, isn't it, reality? <laughs> Absolutely. I think um, <clears throat> having that childishness and that playfulness is so important. You know, I think when we talk about even finding partners in life, we talk about someone to grow old with, but it's about someone to be a child with forever isn't it it's yeah. finding that kind of um that all the things that you love as a child are really what connect you to the core of yourself I yes. think um so that was definitely how I always found my way back to myself was through creativity and oh. play really uh so can I ask what did you love as a child were you watching much tv or films or what sort of culture were you, you sure? consuming I would watch a lot of old movies really old Hollywood films oh. um lots of Hitchcock and Fellini and things that I probably shouldn't have been watching maybe as right. a child. Yeah. Um, but I was always very entranced by women like, you know, Betty Davis and Barbara Stanwyck and these very strong, um, uh, I guess, women on the edge. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> um, and that was always what I was really drawn to, I think, even as a child, that idea of... Um, pushing all the corners of your human experience. Um, ah. That was always what I really enjoyed right. doing. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting you mentioned those, those strong women there. We'll come to this in a moment because uh, in our email exchange prior to you coming today, we would t I asked you for your, uh, your first Anderson memory and it was of a, of a very particular character. Uh, who many would consider to be not a strong character at all. Oh, interesting. Uh, perhaps we'll leave this conversation until we see it. Sure. But before then, I'd like to play a quick game with you. Yes, now, lovely. Uh, this is called Super Identification. <sighs> no, no, there's no pressure <laughs> at all. It's just a bit of fun. Uh, I'm going to play you some very quick clips from every one of the title sequences of Jerry Anderson's shows from the 1950s all the way through to the 2000s. 18 in total. Oh, wow. You can see a few scores ranged here of previous guests. Don't worry, we're not expecting you to be anywhere on there. Low or high, it doesn't matter, okay? It's just a bit of Perfect. fun. So have a look at this and okay. feel free to shout out any that you recognise or you're confused by. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Okay, firstly, we're going way, way back here. Oh, wow. That was quick. Second one now. Still black and white. Oh, my gosh. Not ringing any bells. No. No, fine. <laughs> Still very early days. Space 1999, maybe? Oh, hold that thought. Oh. Now, here's one. Oh, yeah. Thunderbirds, of there's, course. There's, yes. your, there's your first ticket Wee. for free. <laughs> very quick. And on to the next. Mm. This is a, a rather curious piece. No. And into live action now in the 70s. Oh, wow. Robert Vaughan oh. and Dog. What did you mention earlier? Oh, Space Nights Got it. This is an emergency. Into the 80s now. Very popular with students, this one. God, it's too fast for my brain. Very, very quick. We're almost there. And finally, gosh, there we go. 
I know. I know. That's my. <laughs> I know. They come at you Bambuza. hard and fast. Gosh, I can't believe someone got all eighteen. <laughs> they did. I can't believe that Jerry made eighteen TV no, series. No, neither can I. Gosh, can you imagine that? Just getting one off the ground is yeah, difficult yeah, enough. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Uh, I mean, I'm sure you won't be surprised to know you got two. Me. Two is okay. Two is better <laughs> than one. Uh, so look, there's your score on your rather fetching. Uh, oh, thank you. Very own Thunderbirds <laughs> doll that we'll put on the table a little later on. Uh, so obviously not that familiar with Jerry's work. I mean, I know you are familiar to some extent mm-hmm. because you've uh, given me a few heads up of some things that we can look at later. Uh, but uh, so what does the name Jerry Anderson mean to you, if anything at all? Obviously not very much as a young girl, but did you ever become aware of things like Thunderbirds? Can you remember when you first... Yeah, definitely. I, I remember watching ah. uh, Jerry Anderson TV programmes growing up, but yeah. I don't think I necessarily was a fan. So in my brain, I don't think it's cognitively logged them as, oh, yes. this is this particular character from this particular show. Yes. I think the uh, the look of Jerry Anderson is so definitive that you can see a clip and know that it's Jerry Anderson, yeah. puppetry, puppet work. Yeah. Um, but for my brain, not necessarily from... <laughs> Yeah. Which particular shows? I think for me as well, not being particularly sci-fi minded ah. as well, maybe. I don't know. Well, for a young girl who was happy watching Fellini films, yeah. <laughs> I can imagine maybe the world's not. a Jerry Anderson. What, so what's the one that he did with Robert Vaughan then? Uh, that's The Protectors. Oh, So that's not sci-fi. That's a ah. sort of a bit of an outlier in that the project was brought to him rather than him producing the project oh, from interesting. scratch, if you see what I mean. So, yeah, that's uh, it's more of a sort of a, 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 a spy adventure series from 1970. Chris? One, two, three. Ah, <laughs> one, two, three. Uh, but yes, yeah, Space 1999, you, uh, you you did remember. and You mentioned that early on, so that's mm. obviously a name that was sort of floating around. Yeah. I think it's also because of the big Finnish connection, because they do uh, audios, don't that's they? That's right, the big that Finnish, and yeah. UFO as well, yep. which is another one up there as well, yeah. Ah. Uh, so you have children of your own now, I believe. So what are they watching? As, as How old are they? So <laughs> I've got two little boys who are four and seven. Right. And I think the way that children consume media now has changed so much and they prefer to watch other content created by other children, really. So they watch a lot of children's YouTube. and Really? And created that. by other children? So obviously, you know, parents behind it and sure. stuff, but they like watching other children wow. um, playing games or opening toys and that sort of thing to right. kind of connect with their, their peer group, much more so than even film. You know, we'll go to the cinema and they enjoy that experience, but they're, they're much more interested in the immediacy of how it mm. kind of connects to them rather than going into a fantasy land and being drawn into something otherworldly, I would say, from my experience yeah. with my and, kids. Yeah, and how do you view that? Is, do you view that as something of a shame or is this just, you know, every generation is different and moves on to other forms of media and we've just yeah. got to accept that? I think it's just the way that the world is changing really, yeah. isn't it? I think so much of our real life is transferring to being online that I think it's natural that children would project and see a version of themselves online and that's how they would... Um, envisage them I guess as kids when you watch shows when you watch films you're kind of envisaging yourself as an adult aren't you to some degree or yeah. maybe this will be me maybe uh. something will happen to me and when they watch other children and you know going on holiday somewhere yeah. or uh, playing a game that they want it's it's almost that forward projection I guess yeah um, but it has more immediacy because they're seeing another child of their age do it so yes. I guess it's just um I think as they get older, they'll probably appreciate different TV and film. Um, but at the moment, I think the ages that they are, they prefer their own peer group, really. Yeah. No, it's interesting isn't it? the, way, the way it's evolving and mm. the way children are absorbing media yeah, rather definitely. than sort of watching it appointment to view has gone. I mean, that whole idea of sitting as a family around a TV to watch a programme is sort of pretty non-existent now, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's a shame. I definitely do feel that. I mean, I used to watch a lot of these more adult films because I was watching them with my parents, whereas my kids now, even at four and seven, they don't want to watch the same thing as each other. So there's no chance of of all of us watching something together. Um, I think the only film that we've ever all watched together is probably The Wizard of Oz. So they do like (laughs) older older cinema and they do connect to that. But uh, yeah, I guess... And as a young girl from a you know a, a family that was in the business and uh, moving into the business yourself, were you watching TV from an insider's point of view or an outsider's point of view? A little bit of both. I think obviously people ask me quite a bit, you know, did I enjoy Doctor Who when I was a child? And I think one of the reasons I didn't was because I would watch it with my mum and she would obviously be commenting on everything and, <laughs> oh, this Great. person is this, that person did that. Oh, God. You know, so you sort of start to disconnect from it a little bit. Yeah. Um, so I think it would depend, really. And I think if you have parents who are actors, it is impossible to watch anything without them saying, oh, I know so-and-so, you know, yes. trying to watch Jurassic Park. Oh, look, there's Bob Peck. Oh, yes. you know, I, I just, yes, right. it kind of breaks the fantasy a little bit. Yeah, but, uh, yeah that's right. Yeah, to an extent. Uh, you mentioned, you brought up the, the sort of um, the science fiction world there. 
that has sort of held no interest for you as a child, but it's a, a world that you've kind of finally had to embrace. <laughs> Not had to embrace, you chose to Forced embrace. To. <laughs> uh, so are you happier within that world now? I think so. I mean, I think for me, when I say science fiction, I think of it in a very purist way where it's, uh, you know, um, little green men mm. with three heads, yes. you know, Carrie John would say. Yes. Um, whereas I think with, say, with Big Finish, a lot of the sci-fi is wrapped up in something bigger than that. Like, say, you know, Michael Crichton talking about Jurassic Park yes. just moments ago. Yes. That idea of how, um, you know, science fiction can shape our society and how it can actually involve, you know, going back and forth in time yeah, and yeah. Uh, replaying history. So I think there's so many different components to it that as a child, I wouldn't necessarily be aware of uh, com coming under the umbrella of science fiction. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, now, it's time to have a look at your first Anderson memory then. You chose a rather specific character <laughs> and a rather specific song. Uh, so let's have a look at this. <laughs> that start whenever you're Marina, Aquamarina, why can't you whisper the words that my heart is longing to hear? And there she was, Aquamarina from Stingray. Yes. And that beautiful uh, closing theme from the closing credits as well. What was it about Marina that, uh, that transfixed you so? Well, when I was a child, obviously I was obsessed with mermaids and underwater and everything like yes. that. So seeing her in the water, I was like, I want to do that immediately. Let, <laughs> let us go to the swimming pool and try and recreate those moments. Right. I think the music as well is just so entrancing, isn't Speechless, it? I remember my it? dad like singing along to it and yeah. things. Every um, dad will sing, sing along to that, <laughs> believe you me. <laughs> yeah. um, just something so magical and so otherworldly about it, I think. Yeah, that's right. Um, and in, I guess, a series that's quite male centric, I mm -hmm. suppose, mm -hmm. um, to have something so ethereal, I thought was very um, in captivating for, a, for yeah. a little girl. Yeah, certainly. Uh, but what's interesting about Marina, of course, is that she never speaks. So that's why I was interested about you ah, saying yes. about, you know, strong, you could be a strong woman and, and not have a, a line of dialogue. Absolutely. <laughs> but uh, so, uh, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, but yeah, that sort of wafty movement. I mm. used to have a similar thing, you may not remember, uh, Patrick Duffy in uh, The Man from Atlantis. No, which is a TV series, and he played oh. a man from Atlantis in modern times. Oh, but he wow. had a certain way of swimming underwater, which oh, I would try and, uh, yeah, yeah. I'd try and emulate it in the swimming pool. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's terribly sad, isn't it? But there was another, I can't remember her name now, another female character in Stingray who is quite... Atlanta? Yes, the, the daughter... Yes, the daughter of Commander Shaw, yeah, yes. Yeah, so she was, I always remember she was quite... In charge and right, yes. knew what was exactly. actually going on. Yeah, yeah. So you yeah, still got right. that strong feminine yeah. energy. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Did you ever have a Marina cosplay outfit like you would do these days, of course? No, I didn't. I, I think <laughs> cosplaying now is amazing, isn't yeah, it? it is. Just fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, I have to mention your recent picture on Instagram oh. that seemed to take the world by storm. Uh, would you like to explain? <laughs> oh, well, no, I just dressed up as my mum. Not even the whole costume, just yeah. the... <laughs> <laughs> the top half from uh, from Planet of the Spiders yes. uh, using our spider that we put up for Halloween and just yes. like a little stripy top and yeah people were very receptive to it which was really nice uh, it was lovely yeah absolutely it was in the Radio Times they tweeted it the whole sports I mean perhaps this is a bit of a heavy question do you feel that you're somehow curating your your mother's sort of legacy and and so on in in, in the little homages and obviously playing Sarah Jane for yeah, the finish not not particularly I think that people nowadays like to brand certain things and put a certain narrative on things because it creates content mm. because the importance of creating content is mm. just part of anything show busy nowadays yeah. I guess yeah. um, but I just live in my own little silly world yes <laughs> do absolutely. silly things that, that yeah, make me happy right. and hopefully don't offend anyone <laughs> no, exactly right great uh now we do have some fantastic questions from our listeners and viewers if you're happy to answer them. yes so we put them in our rather um tasteful Aww. space 1999 lunchbox the chap on the front yes martin landau as Commander Koenig, the lead actor from Space 1999. I never knew that. Google oh it. my gosh. Yeah. I love Martin Landau. I, well, I, well, I think you'll love Space 1999. Yeah, worth a look, isn't it? Oh, wow. Every day is a school knew, day. Yeah, I never knew there. that. Oh my gosh. There you go. So reach into there and uh, take a, a, 
question. Okay, so this is from John Reed. Mm-hmm. If you, oh, I think we've probably covered this. Go if on. you could be any character in a Jerry Anderson series, <laughs> who would it be? Well, I would have said maybe actually Atlanta. Yes, right. But now, uh, any, any character any in character? Space 1999 in order to meet Martin Landau. <laughs> <laughs> if I could go back in time. Well, you Can't could, believe that. You could always be uh, Barbara Bain. With a dime of hair, yeah. sorted. But his wife in real life played played opposite him in Space 1990. That's amazing. I can't believe I never knew that. What yeah. a terrible... Not at all. <laughs> no, 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 no. We forgive you. Don't worry. <laughs> Add another question. Ooh, a, a chunky one. Scott Anthony Bicklicky. I That's hope, it. I hope I'm saying that right. Yeah. Hi, Sadie. My, ooh, my question is, if there was ever a reboot of Stingway, this is insane, what would your dream role be, such as Atlanta, etc.? Ah, well... Well, I'd love to play Atlanta, but I would also happily play anyone the actor's response. Oh. I, I will play anyone. <laughs> yes. Yeah, quite literally. <laughs> Please cast Available me, Jamie. Available for panto, bar mitzvahs, children's parties. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Please cast me, Jamie. Thank you. <laughs> not, not, the... not too subtle a, a plug for work there, I don't think. <laughs> oh, and um, Steve Bushell. Oh, my God. Oh, oh, my gosh. Sarah Jane Smith was my doctor's assistant. Oh. My sister almost got named Sarah, but my parents vetoed it. <laughs> What? <laughs> Apparently I called her Sarah anyway. Oh, that's lovely. My question would be, how old were you when you realised your parents were famous? Ah. So I, I don't think of my parents as famous, obviously. Yeah. I mean, I think if you're maybe a Brangelina child, then you could say your parents are famous. I call my mum a niche micro celeb. Oh, you know? <laughs> I think that's slightly unfair. <laughs> well, but actually, yeah. before she died, if you Googled her name, a picture of Sherry Lungi would come up, uh-huh. which I would... Why? I, I don't know. So I used to troll my mum about it. We would love about it. How bizarre, yeah. Um, Gosh. I think probably when I started going to the conventions, I realised my mum had a little bit of profile and that so Doctor Who was this with great... with her, you mean? Yeah, ah. she, would, she would always take me along. Right. Um, and obviously I realised her connection to Doctor Who and how important it was to other people, which I think was the most amazing part of it, really. Not that yeah. she was famous, but that she was connected to this wider community yeah. that you know, meant so much to, to people, which was always really special. But yeah, no, she used to take me along and yeah. I, I, I haven't taken my kids, so. Ah, I was going to say, you, of course, you're now part of that community. Aww. So how does it feel now from, from that, the other side of the, of the fence, as it were? Oh, yeah, I mean, it's very humbling, isn't it? Yeah. I think to be, obviously, you know, we've performed together, yeah. I think we can say. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's incredibly humbling to be part of something that is so special to people that people grew up with that's now generational, you know, parents watching it with kids, I think is just magical. And yeah. we need more of that in the world. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Here, here. Uh, time for a couple more, I think. So uh, deep, well, deep, plenty in there. That's it, it. Don't worry. Right, here we go. <laughs> Jonathan Westall. Oh, I'm really enjoying your performance as Sarah Jane Smith, my favourite companion for Big Finish. How has it been for you playing a fan favourite character over the past few years? So I would say when I first started, I was obviously very apprehensive because it's a well-loved character and you don't want to mess it up. Um, And then once the Sideman story came out and people accepted my performance as Sarah, um, it's all kind of snowballed from there and been been a wonderful experience and a privilege to be be a part of. But I definitely was very nervous. And if, if it wasn't for... The, the fans of the show and people accepting me, there wouldn't be, yeah. I wouldn't be able to do it. So thank you. Thank I, you to I, all of you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think it's fair to say that there was a little disquiet about the idea of recasting favourite old characters, particularly yeah, totally. from actors who, who are no longer with us, the earlier doctors and companions and so on. Uh, but how difficult, or was there ever a moment of doubt for you? Or, or was it a given that you were going to do it? Yeah, I mean, I think... Daisy and I, you know, uh, take over from our mum. You always yeah. have that that thing of should I do this? I'm I'm not not quite sure. Um, I think when they brought in Tim to be John Pertwee, they did it very sensitively because he was the narrator. I think first of all That's before right. he then took over the role properly. That's right. um, but they approached me at a time in my life where it just slotted in very well, and I felt like it was the right the right thing to to yeah. do. Um, in lieu, obviously, of 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 mum not being able yeah. to do it. That's um, right. Yeah. And of course, she would have been delighted, wouldn't she? Oh, well, I think she'd probably be pleased it was me rather than someone else. But, exactly right, um, yes. I'm yes. sure she'd have some comments on my performance. <laughs> OK, and the final one Thank for you. now. Let's do a chunky one. Right. Good, yeah. From Alex Pass. Uh, Sadie starred in several excellent audio remakes, alternative versions of classic Who stories, and recently was pictured recreating that famous Planet of the Spiders publicity still. Uh-huh. Ah, is there a particular Sarah Jane story or scene that she'd like to take a crack at in the future? Ooh. Well, I got to do so. I got to do Genesis of the Daleks with um, Jamie, obviously yes. recreating, which was really so. Talk us through amazing. that. How, how, what's that about? How come you're doing Genesis of the Daleks? So I think they re- they found some of the original scripts, ah. um, and so they were kind of 
recreating what might have been on screen and there was a bit of, of yeah. patching it all together, nice. um, which was exciting. But in terms of um, ones I'd like to take a crack at in the future, I don't know really. I mean, my favourite two stories were always Time Warrior and um, uh, Prisons of Mars. Yes. And I think uh, that... Princess of Mars especially has a very hammer horror vibe, yes. doesn't it? The mummy is Absolutely almost exactly right. the same as yes. the Christopher Lee I mummy. It well. So if Jamie wants to make that, <laughs> please call me. I am happy to be chased <laughs> by anyone. So anybody, just leave your CV yeah. on the desk when you leave. <laughs> And just your spotlight link. Pimp my, we'll just tip myself out. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, right. yeah, but, you know, anything. Or Russell. Russell, please call me. Uh, <laughs> Someone call me. Uh, now, I'm guessing you were involved in Big Finch's 60th uh, yes, yes. anniversary special, Once and Future, I think. This yes. sort of uh, umbrella series. Uh, so what was that like and when did you do that? I mean... Uh, so that was a couple of years ago yeah. because we record them, well, obviously you know as well, mm. out of order and at different times mm. or being remote and whatever. It's very easy to lose tracks. So that was a couple of, of years ago now um so it's really exciting for me because when they come out i get to yes. listen to it and hear everyone Afresh. come together yeah Absolutely. which is it's brilliant really uh we worked together on a tom vega story we were saying over lunch that jamie directed and it was during covid so it was remote i was in the cupboard in my garage and uh we were trying really hard to remember which one it was what is that whoops because it's not out yet of course. yeah so it may not be for another year or two i guess so i can't remember the name of it because i yeah. think they changed the name, or ah. there was some confusion with another ah. Big Finish story, I think. Right. So, yes. But I don't think we'd be allowed to say the name if it's not come out. Probably not. No, so we better be very careful. Yeah. I, I expect the first thing we'll know about it is when it pops around Letterbox and we get to yes, listen to yes, it. Yes, definitely. Uh, so I'd love to talk to you more about Big Finish next week and uh, your work as Sarah Jane uh, and others. But uh, for now, uh, I'm going to show you a little um, clip of something uh, where you... Share the screen with someone not a million miles away from here. Uh -huh. So let's have a look at this. Well, of course, I have made a lot of children's programmes, things like Thunderbirds and Captain Scarlet, Joe 90 and so forth. But the real tragedy of my life is that my son, Jamie, is... A Doctor Who fan. Yes, a Doctor Who fan. <laughs> the biggest joy is that a year, year and a half ago, Sadie started to notice Doctor Who, to watch it. And um, you enjoyed it, didn't you? Yeah. And our house is literally packed with TARDISes of all shapes and sizes and videos and books. I mean, you name it, it's there. We're going to have to move house shortly to make more room for his Doctor Who collection. I had no idea, you see, the videos are coming out now. There's a whole new audience. It's so exciting. It's, it's really back to youngsters again and this wonderful thing about a hero and Doctor Who will win. They need it. They love it. I think that um, the role of uh, the, the monster and the frightening story uh, is very much the role of the ogre and the giant in fairy stories. Uh, it's um, something to be frightened of which is containable because it's obviously made up. A child can um, uh, accept a monster when it's quite clearly not something is going to meet around the corner. Oh, Sadie being very brave in the face of a Sontaran. Well, I got to do a really big scream and, and then they cut it out. Oh, no. <laughs> Which I, I remember being very cross about. Um, <laughs> yeah. But that poor, that poor actor in that Sontaran costume, yeah. I remember like... Mucking about that mask and tweaking really his nose mean. and just being oh, a terror. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's uh, more than 30 years in the TARDIS, a documentary celebrating more than 30 years of Doctor Who uh, with you and, uh, and Jamie. Oh, lovely Jamie. But, but you say you never met on the day, of course, because no. it was filmed separately. No, just chatting with Jamie before, I totally thought he was the other kid. I didn't even realise that that was Jamie, which yes. is ridiculous now, well. watching it, where it literally says on the screen, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Jamie Anderson. That's right. Oh, but it's lovely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which sort of brings us to a question, you know, thinking of Jamie and thinking of you uh, in your your position and the careers that you've chosen to to, to follow. Uh, I was at drama school with uh, um, Lucy Briers, Richard Briers' daughter, and Daryl Pertwee, John Pertwee's daughter. Oh, wow. And they sort of sought each other out because they had shared lived experiences of uh, following in famous footsteps, shall we say. Uh, are you aware of kind of, I don't know, uh, being part of some sort of legacy, or is that too grand a term to use? No, not at all. I mean, I think that legacy 
means different things in different ways for people. I think everyone takes from their family things that have come before and mm. you kind of assimilate it into who you are. Um, but it's not something that I would necessarily um, think of in my everyday life, uh-huh. apart from Big Finish. For example, obviously, no one in my local area, I live kind of yeah. quite remote place. No one knows about Doctor Who. Right. No one at my kid's school knows that their oh, grandma is. Right. Whatever. You know, it's yeah. just very separate. I, I, I yeah. And has that been a deliberate thing to keep it low key in, in your life and just be part it of just, your it life? It just never, than... never comes up. Really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I see. Um, and I, I would never bring it up. So I kind yeah. of um, appreciate it and enjoy it for what it is. But it's not something that I would ever, I don't know, try and push to the front yeah. unnecessarily, I yeah, guess. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, now, just before we round off for this part of the interview, it's time to play Quick Fire Five. Oh, God. Uh, it's another game, but do you know there are no points here, so it doesn't matter how well you do. It's simply I'm going to ask you five questions, and they require an either or answer. Okay. So there's no right or wrong answer, essentially. Okay. Are you ready for these? Yes. Okay. A trip to the seabed with Aquamarina or a trip to the stars in Fireball XL5? Oh, seabed. Oh. Choose your transport home Thunderbird 2 or Lady Penelope's Rolls Royce? Oh. Probably Thunderbirds 2, actually. Oh, really? Oh, you get home much quicker that yeah. way, for sure. Uh, you have the keys to the TARDIS. Do you go back to the past and the Wild West of Jerry's series Four Feather Falls or forward to the future and the moon base from Space 1999? Oh, no, that's so difficult. <laughs> I'd, have to, I'd go for Martin Landau. <laughs> uh, would you? Yes. Not sure what Barbara Bain would have to say about that, but OK. Uh, choose a pet. You can choose Oink the Seal from Stingray or Mitch the Monkey from Supercar. Oh, uh, oink. <laughs> and finally, the agents from Spectrum in Captain Scarlet are named after colours. So choose yours from the Dulux colour range. Are you Captain Apricot Crush or Lieutenant Mineral Mist? Oh, uh, Mineral Mist, I guess. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> well done. That's your quick fire fire. Oh, I told thank you it'd be you. quick and painless. There you go. Uh, so all for now, but uh, just in case there are any viewers or listeners out there who might want to follow you on social media, are you active across any X or Twitter or Instagram that you're happy to oh, share yep. with us? Um, so my Instagram is at Sadie Miller Writer VO. <laughs> Yeah, great. A nice long one. Got all that. Um, And then I think from there you can get to threads. I'm not on X anymore. Just Yeah, I see. Yeah, had enough. Been there and done it. Okay. Well, Uh, thanks so much for joining us. I hope you'll come back next time to Slough and join us once more. Thank you so much. Look forward to it. Thank you, Sadie Miller. (laughs) Sadie Miller. Uh, Back next week. Yes. I just have an image of her in her red and white stripy dungarees. Oh, yes. And did you see that fantastic picture of her as, uh, uh, as her mother from the Planet of the Spiders yeah. that she posted in yes, Halloween? Yes, Halloween, lovely. Yeah. It's beautiful. so nice, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. Uh, more from her next week about her Anderson memories. And I think we'll be talking a little bit more about her big finish experience as well. Good. It'll be nice, won't it? Great, she's so nice. Uh, meanwhile, over on our Facebook group, Does It Need Saying, facebook.com forward slash Groups forward slash podsterons. Certainly not like that. No, no, that's right. (laughs) Uh, Anonymous member. I didn't know you could post anonymously. Oh. Fair enough. Uh, Double Dose of Anderson. Thunderbirds returns to Australian screens on 9 Gem, 6 a.m. Saturdays in half episodes, and still the 2001 transfers. This morning was followed by Adventures in Rainbow Country with Atlanta herself. Oh. Says anonymous member. Thank you, anonymous member (laughs) of the member family. (laughs) Is that the yeah. Norfolk members, do you think? Yeah, that probably is, yeah. Yeah. And then Clint Nickel says, just noticed this in the catalogue for the Prop Store auction on the 9th of November in the UK. A bit rich for me. And he posted a link to um, Lot 100, I think, which is a Captain Blackhead with replica body and costume from the Captain Scarlet and the Mistrons TV oh. series. An original Captain Black puppet. Uh, and he posted a picture with the estimate beneath. How much do you think, well, what would you be willing to pay for an original Captain Black head well, and replica body? I mean... Many years ago, yep. I think Dad sold uh, an original Parker yeah. head with, yeah. a, with, a, with a fixed body. Yeah. And back then, I think that went for £30,000. Oh, okay. But then there's the old inflation going on. Sure, there? So, sure. But that's a pretty ballpark figure. Yeah, at least, at least double that by now, I would yeah, say. Exactly, yes. Yeah. But the estimate was between sixty and £120,000. £120,000? What the heck? Yeah. If you had it, would you? But buy it. Yeah, if you had the money, would you? <sighs> no, because I think it needs to go to a collector who really, really wants to have Captain Black in their mm, collection. Mm-hmm. Fair enough. And that's not actually not me. No. No, but you could buy it and then sell it to them for a much inflated price. That would be a terrible thing to do, Rich, and I would never do such a thing. Anyway, moving on. Right. Adrian yeah. John Heath posted, I was just watching the latest edition of the Late Break Show on YouTube mm. and noticed Johnny Smith was wearing a Joe 90 t-shirt. Is oh. he a fan? Could he be tempted onto the podcast? 
Okay, right. Well, there's one for my list. Johnny Smith and the Late Break Show. I'll have a look. Yes, on uh, he's got a, he's got a very unusual Instagram handle, I believe. Remember, fair enough. Well, oh, it's Car Pervert. Oh, right. Okay. I think. I All think right. it's Car Pervert. Fine. Anyway, d- don't go and search for that. Search for the Late Break Show and then see if you can find out who it is. And then, yeah, I don't want to get you in trouble. No. And finally, for now, Daniel Phillips says, because I normally drive vans for the Scouts, I'm usually in some Scout clothing of some kind when I drive them. Okay. So it feels weird driving them in your own clothes. It makes me think of when Virgil takes Thunderbird 2 out, not wearing his uniform. Mm. Also, uh, <laughs> as I use my bike to get to the van rental place, as it could go in the back, that means it technically had a pod vehicle. Right. Living so technically, the dream Daniel, you are Virgil. Absolutely right. Congratulations. Yeah, don't tell the missus, though, because that's Charlotte's hot crush, that was. Oh, really? Virgil, yeah. Gosh. Mm, saucy. Anyway. Yes, that's it for now. Uh, do join in the fun on our Facebook group. But, uh, uh, post your pictures, post your comments, because I very often trawl through and mine it for content trawl for the podcast. Trawl makes it sound like a real, uh, a real hard job. Oh, it's not at all. It's a pleasure. Pleasure yeah. and a joy. A uh, uh, happy trawling. Yeah. And also, of course, I do uh, mention their upcoming guests and uh, ask for your questions. So it's yeah. a great place to uh, put your comments for future interviewees. Great. Yeah. Good. All right. Right. Well, from trawling. Yeah. In a joyful way. Yeah. To uh, randomising. Yes. In an even more joyful way. <laughs> okay. All right. Mm. Yeah. It's time for the randomizer with Chris Dale. Yeah. Should we just let him do his thing? Yeah. Go on then, Chris. Well, Sadie, thank you very much for joining me on the Randomizer sofa today. I believe you have been briefed on what this machine here is. I have, yes. Are you feeling confident that you can press that button and give us a good episode today? I am, yes. Okay, (laughs) let's see what you've got. Have at it. Thank you, that's it. And is there anything in particular you would like to see come up on here today? Uh, I'd maybe say an episode of Stingray, episode possibly. Episode of Stingray. Yeah, oh, wow. Well, that was what uh, our previous guest wanted. He oh, didn't really? get that. Oh, no. And... It appears that you don't get that oh, either. No, it's a supercar. It's supercar. It's the first episode of the second series. It's the runaway train. So it's time to welcome back to the randomizer, good old supercar with the first episode of series two. And straight away, we can tell that between series, uh, this general has uh, has taken something for those very strange pupils, but um, we now have model effects being carried out. Um, this helicopter with a grab is uh, picking up a tank. That seems easy enough. And you know, it doesn't look amazingly convincing. I would guess that's a very basic tank model kit um, that some would be probably grabbed from Woolworths, but. It's it's just a huge step up from from what they were doing in the first season in terms of effects, um, and that leap from series one to series two of Supercar is is an interesting one because I I feel certain areas like the effects they they did improve, um, or at least they were more willing to to try. Uh, perhaps it doesn't always come off. Oh no! Look out! Oh dear. Well, that's our 50p tank from Woolworths gone up in smoke. Yes, but it, it equally, um, you know, we've improved with the effects, we're more willing to make advances. But there is at times a step back in terms of some of the storytelling. Not always. Uh, this was infamously the point where the Woodhouse brothers, who had written most of the first season, were not invited back. Powerful enough. Doctor Beaker sure got himself a pretty important. And uh, Jerry and Sylvia basically wrote the remaining thirteen episodes of the series. Some stock footage there. Must be top secret too. Uh, also between seasons, George Marcel has left, and uh, Cyril Shapps is now voicing Professor Popkiss and Master Spy, and also some of the puppets. Actually, I think really most of the puppets look uh, a bit different. And on the whole, I don't think they look better. Um, Popkiss hasn't changed that much. Mike hasn't changed that much. But Beaker and Mitch in particular, the eyes, the eyes are just not the same in the series two. Uh, you were supposed to be in this room when the massive explosion went off, Jimmy, but, uh, you know... First time, you know. <laughs> oh, dear. So Beaker is working on something. 
something to assist in the lifting of tanks. And I do like the humour in this episode. Yes, we're, we are coming up on uh, quite a, a silly, but... Ah! Ah, this is July 10th! I oh, know! <laughs> Which we've established is a Captain Scarlet day, except uh, it's also the day in supercar history when there was an explosion at the Black Rock Lab. Um, so Beaker is working on on something. He appears to have succeeded. He's very excited here. Mike, I think it's checkmate. Even though I don't think anybody... Professor, I think I've done it. I <laughs> anybody knows what he's doing, but I love that reaction from Mike as well. Beak has succeeded. Keep your heads down. This is going to be trouble. Life for another explosion, Mitch. Yeah, Mitch just doesn't look right for the second series. And also, this is the point where they started to push him more into... even more into comedy than he was already... Um, part of so I really like the first season Mitch He's, despite his you know annoyances he is he is a useful ally to have around not so much in the second series but Beaker has developed an electromagnet for supercar to assist with the lifting of tanks and uh, other heavy things drawn towards the magnet and as you see the other end of the hmm. cable Yes, so perfectly safe to turn on, uh, because of course nobody in the Black Rock lab has any kind of metallic objects about their person. Ah, oh, dear. Also I think between series one and two, and we'll see possibly in this episode an example of that, they've gone from being ultra top secret to everybody kind of knows about them, which culminates at the end of the series in King Cool with them going on TV to play, uh, play a jazz number. Anywho, the uh, magnetic power is building. Right, we're ready. And now... Oh dear. There's lots of familiar sound effects here that would turn up again in many other Anderson shows. Some nice um, body language in the mic puppet there. Well, yeah, it was very impressive. Here we go, comedy time. Trousers come down, watches off. Feel it pulling the buckle on my belt. It's a good thing nobody has like a uh, pacemaker or do do pacemakers have metallic components? Fillings might. Earrings. But Beaker just looks at the chaos and loves it. Ah, mm, satisfactory. Most satisfactory. I'll say it's satisfactory. It's proved that it'll lift over 150... It's one of my favourite Graydon Gould lines, that bit. Just, I, I said before, I always love the uh, reluctance and exasperation that goes along with being Mike Mercury, especially when Beaker's around. Uh, so that's just a lovely moment. Hit the lock on. Power one. A mic will soon be airborne, <laughs> Colonel. And then we will demonstrate with Supercar how the new magnetic grab works. Oh, you mean you fitted the And again, I think I've said before, something I like, but sometimes got a bit excessive in the first season was uh, fretting, fretting about things. So if, if we do this, will this happen? Ah, yes, but Mike, if we do this thing, then this other thing here will not, will not happen. And again, you have a little bit of it there with the general worrying about supercar. Again, this is something you never got in the first series because in the first season, I think in the very first episode, in fact, Black Rock Laboratory is a painting. I don't think you regularly see the outside of the building until the second series, um, which famously, that is the model that turns up in the opening titles of Thunderbirds and gets completely destroyed. Max, Dr. Beaker. Of course uh -oh. it worked. An excellent job, oh. Dr. Beaker, an excellent I thought that was a sudden, uh, very sudden dip there from Supercar, which now has a tank attached to it. Do the sound barrier. Yes, don't you know by now that that is all this team does? Dangerous things. Dangerous? Well... Ah, there you go. Through, through the sound barrier. 
even if I do say so myself with a voice that isn't too far away from Mike Mercury. Sure is a great pilot. Ah, yes. And you sure Re-establishing uh, Professor Hopkins' uh, culinary skill. Yes, yes. Well, as I was saying, uh, Dr. Beaker, uh, we certainly are great. A new belt for your trousers. I will personally see to it that you are well rewarded for your services to the United States government. Oh, uh, <laughs> don't, don't mention it. Uh, well, glad to have been of service. Um, I will give you the plans hmm. so that you can build the device. <laughs> uh, perhaps in the next 10 or 15 minutes. It, uh, oh, there's an old uh, publicity photo of Beaker. I think that's from when he was making toast. Famous now. Yes, uh, it would appear. <laughs> it's a mis it's from a Mr. M. S. Tupspy. Company in England. What's it mm. about, Dr. Beaker? Oh, a new project uh, they are about to test. They have invited me but along. But you're not going. You mean we're going to? Uh, yeah. So that seems to be the first time that the supercar team has got any kind of fame or public acknowledgement. And instead of being concerned about it, as they had been previously, now it's like, oh, great, free publicity. And another very cramped supercar journey. Legroom in that thing is just... I would have to imagine that Popkiss' knees are just under his shoulders. Under his shoulders? Under his chin? I mean, technically, they, they would be under his shoulders somewhere, but not immediately below. It sounds very interesting, ah. Yes, well... Interesting. We should arrive in London. And in the stock footage of London, who do we find? Well, stock footage of Big Ben. <laughs> yeah, let's recognise these two figures. Good evening, madam. I think, yeah, again, these two look like they've had some work done between seasons as well. Good evening, madam. Two single. And this is a fairly uh, grotesque puppet playing the receptionist. We have only two rooms left in. I've just booked ah, okay. So something has happened between seasons that um, uh, means the supercar team are now world famous. Um, maybe Beaker's film that he was making in the, the very last episode of the first season was a big hit. Um, who knows? Somehow we've smuggled Mitch through quarantine, and uh, I think it'll be rather fun to let him loose in London Zoo and see what happens. Ah, yes, there's a train, as you would expect with the title Runaway Train. Yeah. And Britain has none. Yes, Beaker and Popkiss are going to be uh, put in charge of a train. I can't remember why, and it would almost certainly have been mentioned in dialogue that I waffled over. Oh. Yes, also between seasons, I think we lose some of the um, uh, library music, the non-Barry Gray library music that they were quite fond of, and it's all Barry Gray now. Um, that piece of music turned up again in uh, in in later shows. It was in it was in XL5. It's in Captain Scarlet. It's even in 1999. Quite surprisingly, it's in Collision Course. So that when they start the train tomorrow, they won't be able to stop it. And do you know who will be on board that train, Prince mm. Zarek? No, Master Spy. A very important person who has oh, caused them. much trouble to their foreign government. Mm, okay. So are they trying to kill Beaker? Now then, Specifically. if we file away the top of the screws, they will not be able to undo them. And then oh, they will be dear. helpless. So devious. Uh, also nice that there's no security on this train. It's Lots of stock footage this week, though. There may not be any more stock music, but there is stock footage. Ah, new atomic train. Okay. Great excitement at the station here today as we await the new atomic train's maiden journey. It doesn't look any different from a normal train because this is only a test run. 
The atomic engine has been fitted into a standard diesel electric And if not successful, uh, diversions will apply. ...new modern atomic train for this run, the prototype having been developed by an American government. Well, Jimmy, if you felt that badly about it, why didn't you speak up beforehand instead of two minutes before the train is due to leave the station? Yes, for some reason, it's, it's Beaker and Popkiss who have been assigned to man the train. And this is a good example of, I think Cyril Shapps is, as much as George Marcel was an asset to this show, Cyril Shapps is an asset to this show. And it's a shame that he, he never came back to do more voices. He was in one scene in an episode of The Protectors after this. I've always wanted to drive a train. Don't forget it will be my turn soon, Dr. Beaker. All right, the train's only just set out. Why do you need to look at the atomic reactor already? So you will be able to take over. Mike Mercury calling atomic train. Mike Mercury calling over. Uh, hello, Mike. Beaker here. How's it going, Doc? Oh, fine, Mike. Just fine. Yes, I don't okay. know um, the origin of all of this footage, but the shots um, from inside the cab looking straight ahead, this is from the famous uh, London to Brighton film that was uh, quite well known at the time. It was just a, a film of the journey, but I think sped up to like five minutes or something. So it's quite useful for, for this episode's purpose. Wow. Yes. I, I don't know, was Beaker involved with this project before, you know, while he was making the electromagnet, was he also involved with the uh, setup of the train? You would think that the scientists who worked on the project oh, would be involved with this. Such funny. Ah. Dr. Beaker? There is something this wrong. Problem. I cannot seem to reduce speed. The controls seem to have developed a mind of their own. And I don't think um, George Marcel and Cyril Shapps sound all that different. There is a definite, you know, change in style. But there's, there's no real sort of, like, a good pop kiss and a not-so-good pop kiss. I don't know to what extent kids at the time would have been aware. Probably not at all, because uh, they would have been watching this one episode at a time. Say, Jimmy. The train hasn't arrived yet. <laughs> what use are those papers going to be? Ah, oh, right, yes, there's a, a Mitch bit coming up with the cards. Oh. Sabotage. Yeah. It must be sabotage. Somebody has filed. So, yep, the atomic reactor on the atomic train cannot be serviced. It's a very sort of low-key discovery that this is uh, this has happened. Um, what is our speed? But it's nice that Popkus has finally uh, got some time out of the Black Rock Lab. Even if he is stuck on a runaway train, hurtling to his doom. Yeah, uh, professor, oh, yeah. we must keep our heads. The reactor has You're smoking my cigars again. But there's nothing about Beaker in there. I've got the papers, Mike. Oh, now, Jimmy. Yeah, I knew it. I knew they wouldn't believe him. Uh, no one ever believes Jimmy. I wonder why. Oh, you must be imagining things, Jimmy. Mike Mercury, this is Beaker. Emergency. Are you receiving? <sighs> Hello, Dear Dr. Dear. Beaker. Mike here. What's the trouble? Hello, Mike. The atomic... Re and it's so cool. I wonder if this is the first time that an atomic reactor has been fitted to anything, to a, uh, in a, an Anderson vehicle before. Um... Because we really have the beginnings of like a, a Thunderbirds rescue scenario here. Indeed, we saw it with uh, Brink of Disaster, a runaway train needing to be uh, ultimately rescued with magnetic. Rings. And I cannot examine it. Stand by, Doctor Beaker. I got to think of the best thing to do. Roger. Standing by. Sabotage. Buy even more newspapers, Jimmy. 
as soon as I can. Right, Jimmy, downstairs to the lobby, pronto. How long do you think it will be? The Are there any passengers on this train? I suppose there must be, there's quite a few carriages. A half an hour at the most. A very fat man. <laughs> Master Spoon. Oh dear. You must mean Mr. Master Spoon and his friend. Yeah, that's him. Where is he? Okay, so they are actually using the London to Brighton footage as the real London and Brighton. It's quite clever. He's gone to Brighton to watch the train crash. Jimmy, get Mitch. Meet me on the roof by supercar. <laughs> I nearly mentioned the back projection on the train earlier, but this looks like um, Zarin is driving a car that's just stuck on ice. The car's going sideways. And again, Master Spy doesn't look like he has too much room to, to sit. Ah, this is good stuff, though. It's another one-episode attachment to Supercar, though. I don't think I see, I don't think I remember seeing the um, magnet on the bottom again. It's far too bulky to, uh, to make that a permanent change to the model. No sign of him yet, Mike. Keep looking, Jimmy. Supercar to Beaker, Supercar to Beaker. Hello, Mike. We wonder what it happens to you. Oh, listen, Professor. We're chasing Master Spy. He's your saboteur. We'll catch up with him any minute now, and then I'll make him talk. Oh, I wasn't coming to save you, Professor. Good, Mike. Only a hurry. There's not much time. Do my ears deceive me, or can I hear that dreaded sound? What if that is specially shot footage of a, of a car filmed from the air? Good boy, Jimmy. Here we go. It is super. Oh, there they are. My goodness, Master Spy is a big puppet. Big hands, big chin. This is fun, though. It's totally ludicrous, but um, it does show the extent that we're, we're pushing the model footage first, and, and also just the the slightly more absurd visual imagery. That's right, Jimmy. And now I'm going to make him talk. <laughs> What's happened, to Master Spy? Yes. We're flying. Balancing but... Master Spy and Zarin's car on top of a. Uh, some kind of tower. Magnetic lock up. All right, Jimmy. Now we'll hover alongside until Master Spy decides to talk. Gee, I bet this is the first. Okay, Jimmy. Whatever. I'm not even going to dignify your comment with an right. answer. Full boost vertical. Now listen carefully, Master Spy. We know you've sabotaged the train, and you're going to stay right where you oh, are. Yes, and Master Spy's weight exactly is causing the car to uh, rock backwards and forwards. <laughs> oh, I, li I do like this as well, as silly as it is. Um, but they do know what happened to the train. They filed the heads off the screws. Mercury, I give in, but I cannot help you. Nothing can stop that train now. Absolutely nothing. Please. But I want to see him fall to his death, Mike. Must be. No, Jimmy, I don't think so. Oh. I believe you, Master. Yeah, just leave him there. Why not? I'll come back later and pick you up. Quickly, Master Spy. Poor Zarin. It can't be much fun being Zarin. Supercar to Beaker. Master Spies wrecked the reactor beyond repair. I'm coming up to try and stop the train with Supercar. I'll fire the oh, thanks, Jimmy. I never would have found that without your help. Magnetically locked on the roof of the train. There's the track over there, Mike. Oh, it's sweet. It's sweet. Um, I, I mean, for the time, it, it's very ambitious. And it's great to see them experimenting more with the back projection stuff. Or oh, not long to, uh, to catch up to them there. Good thing the supercar isn't too wide for those uh, railway tunnels. Oh no! Hmm. Yes, I should probably have looked uh, more into the history of the London to Brighton footage. I'm sure it must have also been used in uh, other films and shows over the years. There's the train, Mike. A 
about two miles ahead. Uh -huh. Ah, yes. That's um, obviously not a real train. That looks like, uh, again, possibly a train set that they would have picked up from Woolworths. But for a brief shot, it doesn't matter. He's made it! Mike's landed on the roof of the engine and locked on with the magnetic ground. Oh, that's right, Professor. Thank, thank goodness we've got each other to explain the obvious to. Ah, uh, here we go. Supercar slows down the train, having landed on top of the magnet, and... Oh... Uh, just in time stops them at the station. I love you, Professor. It did look quite close there. What would we do without my... Say, are you two train drivers okay? You <sighs> sure gave us a scare. <laughs> it's all in a day's work for Mike Mercury. Perfectly all right. Well, thanks, gentlemen, for the call. <laughs> and now I've got to rescue another couple of guys whose fate rather hangs in the balance at the moment. The quick master oh. Lean backwards. This went on for some time. Oh, dear. So, that was uh, first episode of Supercar Series 2, The Runaway Train. And uh, I, I'm sure I've said... Oh, directed by David Elliott. Um, yeah, which is the first uh, episode of, of his I've seen on the randomizer since he, he left us, uh, which was only a few days ago when, when this is being recorded. Um, and I've said before, I'm not a huge fan of Series 2 of Supercar. I think the, the positive changes that were made are kind of outweighed by some negative changes in terms of the storytelling and the characters. But at this point, None of that is really evident, and it's, it really is what you want from the first episode of a second series. It's building on the strengths and the successes of the first year. So, absolutely, this is a, a step up from, from the end of the first series. It's good stuff all the way along. I love The Runaway Train. Supercar. Supercar. Travels in space under the sea. Blah, 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 blah. Supercar. Yes. It's lovely, isn't it? It is nice. I like a bit of supercar because, mm. as you know, I do bear, it has been said, a startling resemblance. To Mitch the Monkey. <laughs> no, obviously to Mike Mercury. In fact, if you, of everyone involved in the podcast, yeah. who would play whom? In what? In a live action version of Supercar. Oh, I don't know. Oh. <laughs> I thought that was going to be a bit of fun, but let's move on from that. Posterons, if you've got your own podcast team casting for a live action supercar, please do let us know who should play who. I think I know where that's going to go. <laughs> I do too. Don't exactly. be rude. No, quite. That's right. Uh, word in my ear tells me we were talking earlier about the uh, Captain Blackhead. Yes. Well, the, uh, the, the, the auction was uh, a while ago now. Yes. It went for how much, Chris? Went for 75 grand. 75,000. So Earth pounds. So they were right in their estimate. Will you stop saying Earth pounds? <laughs> I don't know why. That's a, isn't that amazing? Seventy-five grand. About, yeah. If you if you're the person who got it. Well done. I, well done. I can't believe you burst into the podcast. Uh, can you lend me a fiver? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Gosh. Well, there we go. Amazing. Do you think they'll be auctioning our heads at some point in the future? <laughs> Do you think we'll get to a point where we can have our heads frozen upon death and they'll be auctioned off? I don't really want to be sold to someone else without my knowledge. I mean, I'd have your head on my what bathroom a... Okay, let's sill. move on from this. To gloat at. Weird. I wouldn't put you in the bathroom window sill. I'd use you as a doorstop. Right. Brilliant. You'd like that, wouldn't you? Yeah. Podstrons, if you've got any idea for the taxidermied heads <laughs> of the podcast crew, do email us, podcastdermied.com. Right, stop it. It's getting silly now. I think we should say goodbye. I really think we should. Yeah, see you next week. Bye. Bye. Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. I feel like we've done our post-show bounce during the show there. Yes. So we've, I've got nothing to say. We've, we've blown it. We've I'm done dry. I've got nothing left. Heads. 
Yeah. Uh, I don't know. No. See you next else. week. Uh, we've got to do something. We've got to make something up. Uh, yeah. No, let's just forget it. All right. Bye. Bye. That was an Anderson Entertainment production.